First of all, my apologies that this is going out later than expected. Uh, despite having more technology than Blofeld round about me, uh, it seems as if we have more gremlins than Oompa Loompas in the factory at the moment. But also my thanks to you. When I checked this afternoon, we've now raised over £24,000 for the Wigtown Book Festival. This doesn't just help ensure that we get the festival next year. It means that they can expand on all the great work they've done this year. I learnt that we've had 49,000 downloads of individual events. If every person were to give one pound, that would be 63,000 pounds. Now, that's an ambitious target, so I'll put a more modest proposal forward. Let's see if we can get 30,000 pounds by the end of the festival. As I said, the quiz has always been a very sociable, very jolly affair, and is a great chance to meet up with friends. So I've brought you know, a friend whom I respect dearly, uh, myself. Here he is, or here I am, 30 years ago, that portrait was done and I'm still wearing the same tie. Uh, it's like the inverse of Dorian Gray. So there might be some more people dropping in over the course of the evening, but I think we'll crack on with round one, which is the general knowledge round. Now, you should have, I say should, I'm not making any promises, um, either an email or some kind of communication that tells you the questions. I will read them anyway, so that we can just try and make sure that the old belt and braces approach works. In fact, my favorite kind of technology is still this. I find that apart from cracking the nib, they work terribly well. So general knowledge. What's the next name in this sequence and what is the connection between them? Percy, Paul, Penelope, Penelope, Peter, Pat, Peter. I'll say them again. Who's next in this list? And what's the connection? Percy, Paul, Penelope, Penelope, Peter, Pat, Peter. Clue, it begins with P. Who rode on these horses? Now, forgive my Welsh pronunciation, but the first is Chlamri. The second is Pegasus. And the third is Rosinante. So that's Chlamri, Pegasus, and Rosinante. They're all in their own way heroes. Which franchises did the following novelists develop? The following novelists, which franchise did they take on? Firstly, Kingsley Amos. Secondly, Sophie Hanna. And thirdly, Ben Schott. Which writers predicted the following things? Firstly, the world brain a massive compendium of all the knowledge of humanity, the world's brain. Which novelist came up with that idea? Which novelist has a novel in which it's said that Mars has two moons before it was discovered that Mars had two moons? Phobos on Deimos, in case anybody's interested. And finally, which short story writer and novelist, a great scion of American horror, predicted the existence of another planet that lay beyond Neptune, although he called it Yugoth. So that's the world brain, who predicted that? That Mars had two moons, who predicted that? And that there was another planet beyond the orbit of Neptune. Who predicted that? I'll give you five minutes or so to just go through what you think the answers might be to collect your thoughts before we go on to round two. Um, 
It's, oh, I'm getting a message through the wonders of technology. And it's from my old friend, Adrian Turpin. Saying, could I repeat the first round for people who are late catching up with us? Well, I can well do that. I think it's actually just that Adrian hasn't got his iPad turned on, so he can't start his cheating yet. But here we go, one more time from the top. What name is the next in this sequence and what is the connection? Percy, Paul, Penelope, Penelope, Peter, Pat, Peter, then... Who rode these horses? And they're all heroes of sorts. Hlamri, Pegasus, and Rosinante. Whose franchises did these novelists develop? Kingsley Amos, Sophie Hanna, and Ben Schott. And finally, which writers predicted the following things. The world brain, an immense computer that had all of human knowledge. That Mars had two moons before it was discovered that Mars had two moons. And the existence of another planet beyond Neptune, which wasn't discovered at the time. And at the time of writing the story, it was referred to as the planet Yuggoth. So that's our, our third trek round, round one. Um, I do have things to do in the morning, so we'll move swiftly on. Uh, I'll give you a few more minutes just for those who have arrived slightly late to the uh, non-party. Um, and it may even give some of you a chance to go and charge your glasses. Um, we would normally be doing this in a pub, the prices are actually better in my house, so that's all right. But at least we can have the chance of all having some flavour of what Wigtown is usually like. Um, people are saying it's all been a bit different and a bit difficult this year. Well, in my experience, almost every year at Wigtown has had some element of chaos. Uh, I sometimes uh, annoy people by calling it the Carry On Book Festival, because you never know quite what's going to happen, whether it's uh, some particularly obtuse customer in one of the bookshops, whether it's uh, a novelist who managed to go to Wigton in Lancashire rather than Wigtown in Dumfries and Galloway. So you never quite know which curveballs are heading your way, but I think that's made us more resilient in terms of how we've coped with the unusual times. So I will wait and see if the wonders of modern technology give me a little wink about whether we can press on with round two, which I believe there is a slide for. Whether there is a slide or not, I have no idea. I'm certainly not seeing a slide at present. But I think actually just speaking, and let's face it, festivals are about speaking more than anything. So we can probably try it with the wonders of the human tongue instead. So what I'm going to do is I will give you 10 people who translated books. And I'll give you 10 people whom they translated. And you're query, your question, your job, your quest. Here we are, we have it up. Now, these are the authors who were translated. So that's Dante, Edgar Allan Poe, Rabelais, Flaubert, Virgil, Hergé, Dufu, Homer, and Kafka. I hope you can all see that. I will read out now the names of the translators. And you've just got to match them up. Some are easy, some aren't. 
But once you can rule out some of the options, you might be able to get the rest. Our translators are Poet Laureate John Dryden, Alexander Pope, Dorothy L. Sayers, the crime writer, Sir Walter Scott, Sir Thomas Burkett, Charles Baudelaire, Willa Muir, Ezra Pound, Lydia Davis, and Anthea Bell. I'll go through that list again. These are the translators, and you pair them up to the person that they translated. John Dryden, Alexander Pope, Dorothy L. Sayers, Sir Walter Scott, Sir Thomas Urquhart, Charles Baudelaire, Willa Muir, Ezra Pound, Lydia Davis, and Anthea Bell. So have a think about that. As I say, score out the ones that you already know and see what you're left with. I'm fairly sure I've seen every single one of these books in Wigtown somewhere during my trochles round the various bookshops. And maybe if you have time tomorrow, it'd be a good idea to go round those bookshops to buy something and also to maybe buy something of the new releases that are coming out as part of the book festival uh, from the Wigtown Festival bookshop, because that too contributes towards ensuring that the festival doesn't just continue, but expands and adapts. I've always found translation rather interesting. Um, I nearly was tempted to put my first girlfriend down who has just translated Homer. Um, I didn't think she'd care. And it is strange reading a work in translation, particularly if you know the translator as well, and thinking, crikey, um, why did you just translate the opening of the Odyssey as, well, the word usually many-minded, as complicated? The, these very subtle differences are quite strange, and the older I get, the more I read more things in translation that I used to, and actually read several different translations of the same book. It's a great way to actually um, kind of polish your eyes again about things. Oh, it seems that Adrian has joined in. I'm sure he's here just to see, well, as you will know from previous years, as you will know from previous years, Adrian really isn't about winning and it is about taking part. You know, there aren't great prizes, you know, a night out with Adrian, uh, second prize, two nights out with Adrian. Um, but he and Peggy have a, an immense and actually rather rancid rivalry. It doesn't matter who wins. As far as they're concerned, it just matters that one beats the other. Now, you know, as a churchman, I do find it very sad to see people rivaling each other with such ferocity. But we will see. What, what are you saying, other Stuart? You're saying you hope the Americans win. Well, you know, you were a younger man then, Stuart. Is Peggy playing? Well, she may not be. I don't know. I see nothing except myself, but then that's true most of the time. Um, you know, 
of all my feelings, egomania has never been one of the least of them. But I think it's about time. Shall we crack on with round three? Can I see okay. a thumbs up from somebody? Well, let's have a thumbs up from somebody. I said to be more than one friend. This is a very sad story, I have to say. Um, a few years ago, I was asked by my dear beloved parents what I wanted for Christmas, and I gave my usual answer. I said, I want nothing. I want nothing. Um, a meal to be in my church, that is sufficient. And they said, no, you've got to have something, Stuart. You've got to have something. So I said, because, you know, egomania is one of my flaws, but rampant sarcasm is another one. I said, I want a monkey. I want a monkey. And on Christmas Day, as I sat with them, and I opened a package which I didn't expect and thought it was socks from, uh, if I could just put in a small advert here, Violet Tate socks in Yetim are quite the thing. In fact, I have them on at the moment. Look at that for good sock. I thought it was socks, but I said I wanted a monkey. And here he is. Coco the monkey has been a, a great friend for the past two years. He's an anarchist. He's an idiot. Um, and Coco helped me a great deal with the next round. I think if you were here last year, you might remember we had a round on dogs in literature. And so in honour of Coco, yeah, yeah, Coco, you can help, right? You can help. You just sit there for a while. Yeah, don't look at the computer, Coco. Just sit your dog. <laughs> Sometimes wish I'd never got that ruddy monkey. Right. Monkeys in literature. In which short story does a murderous monkey rampage Paris? Yeah, I know you didn't do it. Which 19th century satirist wrote Melancour? where Sir Oran Utan tries to become an MP, early 19th century satirist. Yes, Coco, you can give clues. Which novel by Sir Walter Scott has a monkey called Sylvanus, who is instrumental in solving a crime? Yeah, it's one of the bad ones, Coco. I know that. Zach Bustner is a monkey psychiatrist in which novel by Will Self? This thespian chimp recounts his memoirs, including his hatred of Rex Harrison. Name the novel. This monkey thinks he is the Pope and has a donkey friend called Puzzle at the end of which series of children's novels? The Simeon Librarian of a prestigious university in Ankh-Morpork appeared in which novel first? Born from an egg on a mountain top, the monkeyest monkey that ever was, this monkey brought Buddhism to China from India. But can you say the name of the person that wrote his life story? Kala brought up an abandoned aristocratic human boy. But what was his name?
And finally, and the clues in the question here, Alfred Fatigue, a missionary, eventually married Emily, a monkey he met in Africa. What is the title of Collier's problematic novel? We'll take a whiz through them again, just for safety's sake. So, the monkey round. Yes, you can give more clues, Coco, at some point. In which short story does a murderous monkey rampage Paris? Which 19th century, early 19th century satirist wrote Melancour, in which Sir Oran Utan tries to become an MP? Which novel by Sir Walter Scott has a monkey called Sylvanus, who's instrumental in solving a crime? Zach Boosner is a monkey psychiatrist in which novel by Will Self? And I should say monkey psychiatrist, I mean, it's a monkey who is a psychiatrist. He doesn't do psychiatry on monkeys. Well, he does, but um, he is a monkey psychiatrist. This thespian chimp recounts his memoirs, including his hatred of Rex Harrison. Name the novel. Okay, Cuckoo my boy, what is it? Yeah. Also his love affair with Johnny Weissmuller. This monkey thinks he's the Pope and has a donkey friend called Puzzle at the end of which series of children's books? The Simeon Librarian of a prestigious university in Ankh-Morpork appeared in which novel first? Born from an egg on a mountaintop, the monkeyest monkey that ever was. This monkey brought Buddhism to China from India. Who wrote his life story? Kala brought up an abandoned aristocratic human boy, but what was that boy's name? And finally, Alfred Fatigue, a missionary, eventually married Emily, a monkey that he met in Africa. What is the title of Collier's rather problematic novel? So, I'll have to think for next year, having done dogs last year and monkeys this year, I'm willing for any kind of suggestion about another animal round. Could be cats, could be dolphins. That'd be a, a real challenge for me to find 10 novels with dolphins in it. Uh, we could just have a general fish round. But it's up to you. Send in any kind of request for what we do next year, because... I know it doesn't feel it at this present moment. There will be a next year. It may be that we have to get more used to doing things like this, but I don't think that the spirit and the friendliness and the wit of Wigtown is so frail that our current unusual circumstances can in any way knock it back. Um, as I say, any ideas for different rounds, I'd be greatly appreciative of. Um, even I begin to run a little bit low in the tank in terms of what we're, um, what we're able to do. Uh, and particularly at this time when I can't scuttle around. And actually one thing for the next round to be uh, borne in mind is I did all of this without recourse to Wikipedia or the internet. So it is a good virtue during these times that we actually rely on what we already know and don't go scuttling off to Google the minute we don't know something. Now, I believe that my old friend Peggy Hughes is there. I don't know if Peggy can speak to me or whether she's merely somewhere in the ether, but it's good to have her here. I'm sure she is. Uh, oh, she's on Facebook. Oh, I'm sure they're gathering a huge amount of interesting data from this. Um, I should perhaps just say something uh, rotten about Donald Trump to make sure we go up in the rankings a bit, um, or perhaps just advocate some ludicrous policy like uh, 
our dear friend, uh, the Prime Minister. I could just sit here for the next five minutes saying, just remember it's a face, a hands, knees, toes, toes, that's the other one, toes. And oh, it's space, space, because we're going to space. It's a moonshot. Honestly, satire has somehow ground to a crushing halt at this point. Um, somebody who has been at Wig Town before, Martin Rosen, uh, has done, I think, some of his best work, but it's satire that's becoming so outrageously uh, apocalyptic. It's astonishing. And actually, I've noticed, and this is a strange thing, and hopefully tomorrow you'll be able to join me when I'm doing the Ghostlands book with Edward Parnell. Super book about how English landscape and ghost stories go together. There is a wee divagation into Scotland, but you've already had Peter Ross talking about graveyards. Um, I'm also going to be chairing Alistair McIntosh, who has done a book about impending apocalypses as has Mark O'Connell, whom I chaired. And these are all available for download for free. Or as I said, if you just put one pound in, that would be extremely good. Um, but it does seem that there is somehow a slightly morbid touch over our literature at the moment. And I hope that this at least gives us the chance to have a bit of a think and a bit of a giggle. And if the jokes are directed at me, or me, or even my monkey friend, then we have no problem with that. I'm going to quiz us on to the, the most difficult round. And it's difficult because I thought, since we're not handing the bits of paper over to each other, it seems a bit pointless to do a round where there's right and wrong answers. The only answers that I'm interested in are impressive answers, ones that I could dredge out of my brain when I started thinking about this. So it's quite simple. It's 10 words and I want a book, the more obscure the better, that includes that word in the title. I'm going to go through them with a few caveats, but First caveat before I go through them. Anyone that starts putting down Andrew Lang's colour fairy books, that's automatic disqualification, I'm afraid. So, gold, though I will accept golden. Silver. Iron. Diamond. Bronze. Wood, steel, stone, glass, and paper. Once you fill these in, I'll be getting the, um, hopefully getting the results of the first three rounds. And I'll be getting a list of your suggestions. Put your best ones forward. I'll take a look over it while you recharge your glasses and just have a chat if you're on Facebook or whatever, or I don't know if we're actually going out on Zoom at the same time. You're probably using Twitter um, and that kind of thing. But, you know, you have a chat. I'll go and analyze the data and I'll give you those they're not elements. Gold, silver, iron, diamond, bronze, wood, steel, stone, glass, and paper. To make it easier for my immense uh, technical support, just put in your best shot. So if I had put down crimson, 
don't put the crimson petal on the white because most people will do that. Go for your best shot, the one you think is going to be most obscure and most outré. And then we will uh, hopefully give you the halfway rounds and I will check through what you've actually come up with. In fact, as I turn to, as I say, I feel like Blofeld with all these around me. Um, oh. Right, that's okay. As I say, send in your results or your answers. We'll deal with the results. I'm not saying there will be a peaceful transition to who the next winner of the literary quiz is, but uh, I can guarantee that the postal ones haven't come through. Not seen a single thing. Barely seen a postman for the past six months. So on you go. I'm going to go off and think about what we're going to be doing next. And I will see you in precisely. Seven minutes and 20 seconds. Um, if there are any questions about um, Things you want me to say again, questions that you didn't quite get or, or get the what was being driven at. There's time to contact the, ah, I've been told actually, oh, sorry, you're seeing the awful hand of Stuart on this at the moment. Oh, apparently somebody says the questions are impossible. Well, they're not impossible. Uh, can we see the slide for question two again? I've just been told that it's not going to be seven minutes, 20 seconds, as I presumed. It will be 20 minutes. But uh, they're not impossible. They're all gettable. It does take a bit of reading to get through them, but I would say with my hand on my heart, I've seen almost every one of these books in, uh, in Week 10 itself. I didn't scour the National Library of Scotland to find obscure things.
Well, I think that's been 10 minutes so far. We said 20, so I'll blether on and bloviate for a while until I get the email through saying what your suggestions are for books with gold or golden, silver, iron, diamond, bronze, wood, steel, stone, glass, and paper in their titles. I'm sure you're all busily tapping away at Amazon to try and find some, but as I say, I thought it only fair that I would judge it purely by, uh, by the ingenuity, which I know that this audience can come up with, of your suggestions. And in fact, I would say quite seriously, if there's a book there that I don't know, I will be extremely glad it can be added to the pile of things that I really ought to read. At least uh, this year, I did toy with the idea of doing a whole round purely about patristic theology, but I thought that even by my sadistic standards, that seemed slightly de trop. Um, but again, you know, hopefully this time next year, we will be doing this in Wigtown. Actually watching that lovely film there made me realise how much I think of Wigtown as a second home. Um, as some of you know, my grandfather lived in Sorby, just up the way from you, when he was a small boy. Um, a man who saw the tall ships coming in at the beginning of his life and saw the moon landing by the end of his life. Um, I don't know quite what he would have made of Zoom. I doubt very much he would have liked it. Although I've been quite heartened by the resilience of people in using this. I'm pretty much a Luddite. This laptop is basically clockwork. I only use it as a typewriter um, telegram machine hybrid. Um, but having had to do quite a few things for quite a few different organisations that I'm involved with, whether it's the community council, whether it's uh, the church, whether it's just catching up with people, it's been quite kind of gladdening that, although we sometimes think, oh, well, you know, that person, they're 72, they're never going to manage to use this. People have stepped up. They really have stepped up. And that's encouraging, particularly given that, um, and here speaks the Calvinist, I see no end in sight. And indeed, uh, in some ways, the rhetoric about getting back to normal, I've always said, well, normal wasn't that great in the first place. Getting back to something better might be a far more significant thing for us to be doing. In terms of what's coming up in the literary world soon, uh, I had an email today saying that the Booker Prize is going to be moved two days ahead from when we were told it was going to be announced. And I've never quite, um, never had an email quite like it in that uh, the reason is it was to be announced on the 17th of November. It will now be the 19th of November. Again, most people will be using this kind of technology to participate. Um, it's because the 17th of November is when Barack Obama's new book is going to be published. A book which I think may have some very quick uh, rewrites put in after the beginning of November. So we will find out who the winner of the Booker Prize is. I have never read fewer books on a Booker Prize shortlist ever. Um, and in a way, that's a good thing. In a way, that's a very good thing that we can actually begin to learn a few things about cultures and identities that we might not have been so acquainted with beforehand. So whoever wins it, uh, I'm pleased that we're having a more diverse version of publishing. 
there are a few books which I deeply regret aren't on it, um, particularly Matthew Farrell's Hamnet, which I thought was astonishing. I did say to her, I think your publicist went a bit over the top that you write a book about a plague and suddenly we're all uh, in Plaguesville for the foreseeable. But, you know, just because something wins a prize or is shortlisted for a prize doesn't mean that uh, it isn't something worth seeking out. And I'd certainly seek out Hamnet. Um, you'll have noticed that other Stuart is away. It's because the time at the moment is 21.46 and other Stuart really wants to get to the pub before the 10 o'clock lockdown. You know, he's made of oil and paper and, and canvas. So, you know, how he's thinking he'll get a drink down his throat, I've got no idea. But that's where he's off to. My dear friend Coco, oh, he's passed out there. I mean, honestly, just too much excitement for him. First book festival he's been at. He wants to go to some more. Uh, in fact, he thought he could even ask some questions at the next one. Although, you know, we'll, we'll need some kind of translator for the way that he speaks in his native chimpanzee. So all that has been an interesting end to um, this particular segment, but we still have the answers to go through. Um, I don't know how people are contacting the festival. I don't know if you're doing it by Zoom or if it's by Facebook, um, an area, well, a swamp I've never dared to put my toes into. So um, I don't know what questions you're asking, which brickbats you're hurling, uh, which plaudits you're giving, but do keep the questions and comments coming. It's very useful in terms of how we analyze what works and what doesn't work and how we go forward with this. Do just be in touch with the book festival to say, that was an event I really liked, more like this, please. Or to say, that's that you disappointed me. Uh, if only we'd had something like that. Um, well, I've just had a question put through, which has been sent privately. Um, luckily, it's neither from my accountant nor from, um, nor from the newspaper saying that I'm sacked. I didn't think that the new Oliver piece was going to get me, uh, I don't like to use the kind of terminology, the bums rush. But apparently I was so um, critical and sarcastic. It's the review I've written which has had the most number of hits online. And in a way, that's pleasing that people are reading what I write about books. In a way, it just made me terribly, terribly sad um, because the fact that I got more praise for being, well, it's a Russian book and I'm not going to take that back, you know, even when I'm cold in the ground, I'll sweep up like a ghost and just start saying, yeah, that was a real stinker. But you get more credit for being scathing. And I don't think that's right in our culture. I think the idea that being deliberately and almost gleefully sarcastic or just plain rude and bits of the review were plain rude. I mean, I, I'm never going to take back a word of it, but when I look at some of my early reviews, I do think you overstepped the mark there. Um, and hopefully this period of enforced, almost monastic uh, self-reflection has taught us all that it's a really good idea that if you're relying on other people, maybe being kind is a better strategy to go with than being uh, 
obnoxious and abrupt. I've just been told that I'm going to get the answers in five minutes. I'll hold the gremlins to that. That's now... We're at 21.30, so you've had plenty of time to... If you don't know the answer, guess the answer. Um, you have at least a chance of being right. I'll talk through the answers. I'll give... Oh, hang on. Sorry, I've got to turn to my other machine. Oh, I'm not reading that out. Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm not reading that out. It, it was a, uh, a, a comment. I won't say about whom, but not somebody who's at uh, week 10 this year. Uh, but, you know, honestly, uh, I do try and keep the standards up a little bit. But in terms of other book news that we have out there, I think the real striker for this year, and fingers crossed, I still think she has a chance of winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. I just read, and the review will be out in on a week on Sunday, is Marilyn Robinson's Jack. It's the final book in the Gilead Quartet. And I just thought it was one of the most beautiful, disorientating, strange, kind books that I've read for a very, very long time indeed. Um, I think, and this is not a spoiler because it's only one word, the fact that the last word of the whole book is grace tells you a heck of a lot about the entire oeuvre that Robinson has created. And as I say, I, be, I used to say I wanted Thomas Pynchon to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, but now I've switched allegiance and I really think that Robinson is the one who truly deserves it. It's the most astonishing achievement and it manages to be both timeless, very much of the time she's writing about, and very much about our times, given it involves a relationship between a white man and a black woman. Um, there are certain scenes which can't but resonate. So if you do get a chance to buy it, and if you do get a chance to buy it through the Wigtown Bookshop, um, I get a certain um, percentage from Adrian every time I show the bookshop or say to you, put money in the kitty for all this. Um, do get it. Do get it. I also just reviewed the new Ian Rankin, which is extremely fun, as they always are. Um, he's an except, you know, given he's gone on with that character for so long, the fact he can still be inventive with Rebus is a really remarkable achievement. And uh, I hope one year to persuade him to come back down to Wigtown. I think he's been once before, but a lot of the crime writers, because of the publishing cycle, tend to write over winter, tend to do the same myself, although I don't write crime, obviously. But um, it'd be good to get him back and just reflect on, I think this is, well, if you include the Malcolm Fox novels, it must be the 26th novel set in the the rebus verse so hopefully i mean again pick it up uh i find it very difficult into well reviewing or interviewing ian because we are a little thing at the scotsman in scotland on sunday that alan massey will take the rebus one year and i'll take it the next year so i've always got to read two because I'm just petrified that I'll start the book and think, oh, well, Siobhan died in the last book. I never knew that. Siobhan hasn't died. Don't worry. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things about being a reviewer and being a kind of professional critic. 
that is something people don't think about. That, you know, you actually, you, you're never just reviewing the book. Um, you're reviewing, particularly with something like Ian Rankin or even Hilary Mantel. You know, could somebody review the third part of the Cromwell trilogy, The Mirror and the Lamp, without knowing the previous two books? It's a very vexed question. And given that, um, let me tell you, and this is an absolutely no secret, and I've said it plenty of times, um, nobody is in the game because we are expecting an abundance of riches or as much gold as Croesus. We're in it because we love literature and we care about literature. And it's why we support the book festivals, because that's the reason, that's the reason why you get to be somebody else just for a short time. I mean, I pay any amount of money to not be myself most of the time, but it is still an important human lesson that you're going to read in, not because you're escaping the world, it's actually because you're making the world come closer. You're seeing it more. And one of the things that Wigtown has done so well is it's strand on nature writing, particularly with the theme this year about the coasts and seas. To make us see again what we take for granted is an immense, immense privilege now, let me just check again. Sorry, doing the Bond villain bit. Okay. We're at 2803. I expect incoming soon. Ah, uh, oh, we do indeed have one. Okay. Right, they are still tabulating. Now, let me just get this from the other part. Sorry, the ghastly hand of Stuart. Top three teams from the first three rounds. Third equal are Team Shoestring. Uh, hang on. This is a very confusing, this is, this is the problem with people typing rather than writing. I'm presuming, and I do have a degree in paleography, that this is our uh, and five red herrings. Um, there's no second, third equal. So third equal means there's no second equal. First is lizard horse. No, rosemary is third equal. So we've got our, uh, Third equal, Team Shoestring and Rosemary. And first we have Lizard Horse. Second is Five Red Herrings. Which are, looking over these notes, I didn't put red down. I'll maybe do a colours round next year. So I'm going to go through the uh, answers for the first three rounds. Then I'm going to have a look through these and um, make my choices. If you put down anything, and I'm sure it's a real book, take a point, but I'll say which one I think was the most ingenious one, and then we'll uh, continue. Oh, hang on. And I've just been given the 10 minute countdown that uh, get your answers in before then. But look, as I said before, there's no losers in this quiz. Even taking part makes you a winner, given that you all know that it's done deliberately to be as difficult and ornery as possible. So let's get on with the answers. Round one. The next name in the sequence, which was to remind you Sorry. Percy, Paul, Penelope, Penelope, Peter, Pat, Peter. The answer is Paul. 
they've all won the Booker Prize and their name begins with P. So Percy is P.H. Newby, the very first winner of it. Uh, Paul is Paul Scott. Penelope is Penelope Fitzgerald. Then Penelope is Penelope Lively. Peter is Peter Carey. Pat is Pat Barker. Peter is Peter Carey again. And Paul is Paul Beatty, one of the first African-Americans to win the prize. In terms of the horses, Chlamri was the horse that King Arthur rode. It's never mentioned in the Morton d'Artour. Uh, it is mentioned in the Welsh books about Arthur. Pegasus, I realise, is a bit of a difficult one. I should have said the first person to write Pegasus. Theseus does write it later, but Pegasus was written first by Bellerophon, whose Bellerophon is a really strange hero in that we don't really have many stories about him. Uh, we know that apparently he tried to chase after a girl that he liked on Pegasus after he kills the Chimera, and the gods punish him by having Pegasus throw him off the back of the horse, and uh, he lands in a bramble bush and has his eyes put out. Uh, Kierkegaard, one of my favourite thinkers, said it just shows you uh, if you use the gift of the gods to go running after a girl, then expect the worst. Rosinante is the steed of Don Quixote uh, in one of my favourite, favourite books. Kingsley Amos took on Ian Fleming's work and did new James Bond novels. They're actually quite collectible nowadays, so if you do see a copy in any of the second-hand shops, do try and get one. They're actually rather good, although he's one of many people who's taken on the Fleming uh, legacy. Sophie Hanna has been doing Agatha Christie, and in particular, Poirot. And Ben Schott has been doing new Jeeves and Wooster novels, uh, which are, I could say, with my hand on my heart, an utter and complete delight. Um, three laugh a page. In terms of the predictions, uh, the world brain was the invention of H.G. Wells, as one might suspect. Mars having two moons is an odd one. It's Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels. It's, I think, four years later that the first identification of Phobos and Deimos was made. The reason he thought it had two moons is quite peculiar. He said, well, the Earth's got one moon, and at the time, they thought that Jupiter had four, and at the time, they thought that Saturn had eight. So they thought, well, it's logical that Mars has two, which logically would mean that Venus should have half a moon, but Swift wasn't exactly okay with the details. The existence of another planet beyond Neptune called Yugoth, if you've been watching any box sets, you may get this, is H.P. Lovecraft. Um, a man who was obsessed with science and uh, thought that surrealism and Einstein were cut from the same cloth. The translators and their authors, John Dryden translated Virgil. It's a very strange translation. If you ever see a copy anywhere around, do buy it if it's our first edition. His publisher, Dryden had just been sacked as poet laureate and by William III. And his publisher gave Aeneas in the Aeneid a very Roman nose like William III, which infuriated Dryden so much that people who paid a lot of money to get a plate with their name on it, everyone who'd moved from the House of Stuart to what will become the Hanoverian dynasty, uh, was put next to a picture of a traitor. Alexander Pope translated Homer. Dorothy L. Sayers translated Dante, although Barbara Reynolds finished it off from Sayers' notes. You wouldn't think, you know, a cosy crime writer would also do the greatest theological poem ever. 
So Walter Scott translated Goethe, which began his career, and despite being a bit of a fuddy-duddy, the idea that Scott was actually really interested in contemporary German literature is quite astonishing. So Thomas Urquhart translates, and I use the word with a certain intonation in my voice, Rabelais. He expands upon it. There's one scene in which uh, Rabelais lists six different noises that an animal makes. So it counts as meow, dog goes woof. In Rabelais, uh, in Urquhart's over-the-top translation, he expands the list to 27, I think. Jean Baudelaire translated Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Willa Muir translated Kafka, although her husband tends to get the credit for it. Ezra Pound, being as quirky as he was, translated Du Fu. Lydia Davis, great American short story writer, translated Flaubert. And Anthea Bell, of course, translated Hershey or Tintin. So the monkey round. The murderous monkey in Paris is The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Poe. The 19th century satirist is Thomas Love Peacock, probably better known for things like Crotchet Castle and Nightmare Abbey. It's a great book. Um, <clears throat> it's very funny, but it's equally funny in terms of people that think it's outrageous that a monkey should become an MP and the efforts of the people trying to put him forward. He does buy his seat. So Walter Scott, it's a very obscure one, and it's, I really would say, don't read it. It's Count Robert of Paris. You will find copies in many a second-hand shop, it's that bad. And when it was re-edited, the editors put back in Scott's original ending, which they thought was too outrageous to pass muster, because it ended, instead of with two knights dueling, with their wives dueling. The Thespian Chimp is, of course, Cheetah, uh, in the book I, Cheetah, which if you're ever on a train journey and you're absolutely desperate for an escape out of the world, it's an absolute joy. An interesting fact, which we'll come to in a second, the series of children's novels, it's the last battle uh, in C.S. Lewis's Narnia books, where the monkey pretends he's a kind of pope and the donkey puzzle is his silly congregation. It's not one which has been adapted for film terribly frequently. The Simeon Librarian, uh, called The Librarian, first appears in Terry Pratchett's The Colour of Magic, the very first book in that series. The monkey who brought Buddhism to China from India and was the hero of a great 1980s TV series along with Pigsy and Sandy and Tripitaka, uh, it was Wu Cheng En that wrote it. It's a classic of Chinese literature. It's funny, it's profound, it's silly, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and I know that there are copies in Wigtown. Kala brought up Tarzan. She is the ape who brings up Tarzan. And that brings me back to I Cheetah. There are no chimpanzees in the Tarzan books. And in fact, there is no cheetah in the Tarzan books. He's only a creature of celluloid, uh, except when he did his memoirs. And I won't say what he does to Rex Harrison, but it's fairly obscene. Uh, finally, Alfred Fatigue, the missionary who eventually married Emily, uh, a monkey he had met in Africa. The book by Collier, and it is problematic because it is in some ways a tone with racial overtones. 
And in some ways, the fact that uh, Fatty Gay's fiance is so vile to the monkey and treats it as a servant can be seen in a more positive light. But it is, of course, his monkey wife. And again, uh, do look out a copy of it. It's strange, as most things from the past tend to be strange, but it's worth it. Now, I'm going to go through these at the moment. So, uh, in terms of, oh, I'm going to have to go up and down a bit. I'm going to have to check the second inbox. Right. Oh, I'm going to have to flip between these, unfortunately. Excuse the small temporary nature of this. So I'm looking through it and for gold, and my computer has just gone down. It's not always elsewhere where the problems happen. Can you zoom me the list? Right, we're going to copy and paste it in Zoom. I might get the computer. I, I did say it was clockwork, so you were well warned. Right. For golden, let's have a look. I think the point goes to straw into gold. Actually, no, I'm going to change my mind. I think the crock of gold from five red herrings. Um, for silver, well, I'm glad that people didn't put the silver chair or the silver darling. And I'm very glad that um, for the gold round, we didn't have the man with the golden gun or the man with the golden arm or golden eye or any of those. I think for silver, I am going to go with uh, I'm going to go with I'm going to go with the silver lining playbook. Now, who had that? It's a lovely novel. That would rather be in Wake Town. Iron. Now. Iron's a difficult one. I would have gone with uh, Iron in the Soul by Sartre. Or even The Man in the Iron Mask. But The Iron Woman uh, by Team Shoestring. Very good call. <clears throat> the sequel to The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. Um, I think that's a very smart choice. So... Extra point for you lot. Diamond. Uh, again, a lot of these are um, 
are Ian Fleming ones, which is a really strange, uh, strange phenomenon. I don't know diamonds are golden. Disappointed that nobody tried um, the Eustace Diamonds by Anthony Trollope. But anyone that put, uh, let's be generous, Stuart, anyone that put diamonds are forever, take a point. Bronze. Now, that's a more difficult one. Well, I'm liking the boy with the bronze axe. That's a that's a good call. At the moment, it's out front, but I think I'm going to go with um, yes, Pushkin, the Bronze Horseman, because it's a lovely opera as well. Wood now, woods are a funny one. What did I have down? Uh, I had Hardy's The Woodlanders and Stella Gibbon's Nightingale Wood and Horwood's The Animals of Duncton Wood and perhaps even Murakami's uh, Norwegian Wood. But let's have a look at what you came up with. Uh, You know, for the sheer cheek of it, I'm going to give it to Jane Fellows for Victoria Wood Plays. That is, I always like when somebody turns the whole thing around. But also, um, you know, Under Milkwood got a mention, you know, good call out there. Now, Steel, I think I know exactly which one I'm going to go for here. Um, I would have put down Ernst Jünger's Storm, and Storm of Steel, but I think Five Red Herrings get it for me because of my love of sci-fi with the stainless steel rat. Um, I still remember it being in 2000 AD comic, but you know, again, Steel Magnolias, good call. Mark Steel's in town against Again, cheeky, but uh, clever. Um, oh, apparently there is, there is a slight problem with them filling in the bronze one. And I'd be asked to reread all the answers, but I'm sure you're taking notes. So can you just drop a note either on Facebook or by Twitter to the book festival and see which ones I selected. Stone. Hmm. Stone Diaries is a good call, the Carol Shields novel. Uh, what else do we have? Well, it's got to go to Graham and Sarah. He Man and the Memory Stone. My youngest brother was a huge fan of He-Man. I would never have thought of He-Man and the Memory Stone. Shout out as well for Cutting for Stone, which was uh, Lorraine. We're on to Glass. The one I put down was the Glass Books of the Dream Eaters, Dahlquist, which uh, I really like. The Glass Bead Game, again, a good one. Uh, Herman Hess. Uh, the Girl with the Glass Feet. Again, very good call. I think, though, I'm going to go with Donald's The Glass Blower. Uh, not a book I know, but that means it goes on the list of things that I should know. And finally, paper. Lots of ones we could have had here. Henry James's The Aspirin Papers, um, Ken Lou's The Paper Menagerie, Jackie Kay's The Adoption Papers. I'm surprised that Peggy Hughes didn't put in 
um, novel on yellow paper by Stevie Smith, given I know how much she likes them. But again, I'm going to go for one. For, well, I'm tempted with Donald's paper making as an artistic craft. Um, the yellow wallpaper is one that's a good one as well. Um, the Pickwick Papers, yep, great. But for one which... <coughs> I don't know anything about the paperback princess. So that time it goes to Susan. Now, if you all just tot up the extra points you got, if you got anything, give yourself a point. If you got the one that I chose, give yourself, oh. Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's what we're at. Um, so if you top them up and send them via Facebook or via Twitter, then we can begin to decide who's actually won it. And as I say, I hope you've just had fun going through it all. Very pleased to see Charlie Fletcher getting a mention. He's one of Scotland's hidden gems. And again, I hope to have him down in Wigtown at some point. Um, you know, they are such ingenious books. Just looking through other things that I had. Oh, Ruth Rendell's A Judgment in Stone and Susan Walker's The Walking Stone, Stones. Steel Bonnets, bit obvious, but I thought John Burns, Superman, Man of Steel might have got through. Um, Silver on the Tree by Susan Cooper. Um, the Golden Bowl by Henry James. The older I get, the more I like Henry James. Um, for Wood, I was thinking The Darkest Part of the Wood by Ramsey Campbell. If you don't know Ramsey Campbell's work, he is possibly the best horror writer of his generation. Post-war horror, and therefore quite sort of distinct from the M.R. James tradition of, of Edwardian dons and something dark in the night. Um, so, you know, there's, there is a lot and it's always uh, a good chance to expand one's reading horizons, as is indeed the whole book festival. As I say, I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you turn up to other things at the book festival. I know we can't clap, but I would like to give a virtual round of applause to the hard pressed technical team and to the festival itself and everyone who organizes it and makes it happen. Because, you know, we need our small joys in these curious times. So please join me in giving a round of applause to all the staff here. And while you're doing that, uh, one of the technical elves has said that they would uh, be grateful if you can put in what you got in round four and they will do the adding up. They're pretty good at technology. Their adding is bad. I mean, frankly, Coco could do a better job sometimes. Um, at least we're not doing long division. I mean, that's just way beyond them. So hopefully they will get something there. Hopefully you'll be able to go off and charge your glasses and think about, I mean, do please be in touch with the festival. I can't stress to you quite highly enough how important it is for feedback from you. Who is it you want to see here? Who are the writers that you think should be here? Who would appreciate being in this place? It's a very special place in terms of the fact that it's unlike, I mean, I go to a lot of book festivals 
but it's a very different kind of festival here. It feels much more orientated towards community, much more orientated towards landscape, towards how we live in the world. Indeed, the event with Alistair Macintosh, I think that's the prime thing we're going to talk about, the links between community and ecology. So, you know, they've, they've really managed to carve, I don't like saying carve out a niche, it seems a very, very violent image to my mind, but they've created a space which is unlike other spaces that I go to, not just for work, because I love going to the festivals and the chance to actually hear an author often gives you a voice in your head that you wouldn't otherwise have. And that is something which we can keep doing, even in this uh, strange, nebulous, virtual way, we still can actually have that experience of hearing what the voice is actually like. Uh, some of you will have been at A.L. Kennedy's event the other day, and I have reviewed A.L. Kennedy a great many times. I've chaired her a great many times. It was only when I first heard her reading that I thought, you're a complete idiot, Kelly. You never realise that they're funny. You always thought these were serious, gloomy books about despair and depression and ennui. And yet when you actually hear the way she reads it, they're incredibly funny. Uh, as I recall, she was reading part of Paradise about the alcoholic uh, woman, Hannah, which is all structured around the Stations of the Cross. And people had tears running down their faces. And yet she was saying, look, I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny. And what was funny was her saying, I don't think it's funny. That seemed to work. Now, hopefully the elves are busy away. Oh, nothing through yet. Oh, my poor old workhorse of a laptop. I really must learn how to back things up. I'd be lost without some of the files on that machine. Ah, we're still waiting for a few people. Sorry. To tell us their scores. I'm almost in my Alice in Wonderland mode now and say all shall have prizes. Taking part is more than enough. I know people want to be the victors and all the rest of it, but I am declaring whoever actually comes out numerically the victor, that I think all of you have done brilliantly. And I was incredibly impressed by what you came up with in the titles round. That was an incredibly good job by every team that was there. Um, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one not to just jump to the obvious one. Um, the one which I was quite surprised about not turning up was Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, or indeed Paul Oster's City of Glass. Um, it's a strange word to use in a title. Um, I kept on thinking there must be an Agatha Christie called Through a Glass Darkly or something like that. There's the mirror crack from side to side, but I think having mirror and glass is possibly a little bit of a cheat. Um, I was a bit worried about having golden in even, um, despite scribbling one down myself. But that way in which you dredge up your own, your own internal library. Ah, oh, the elves have managed to find some extra tools. 
So the winner is, and I don't know who they are, so I can't be accused of anything, Lizard Horse. So Lizard Horse, um, be very proud of yourself for that. But everyone who's been here, be proud of yourself. And please continue to watch the events, continue to support the festival, because I've always said beforehand at events that it's not about me, it's not about the author, it's about you and your continued, much appreciated support. Thank you all and good night.